Good morning, good morning, Rabbi Welcome back to Breakfast in the Class. Breakfast in the Class is dedicated for the continued health uh, of uh, all of our hostages uh, that are uh, there. Unfortunately, we're starting to see that some of the hostages that are coming back are uh, not, they're not in good health, they haven't been fed, they haven't been given medical attention. Uh, so the ones that are, are, that are, are well, I, I, we pray that they should be, uh, have continued health until uh, their ultimate return, Bekarov Mamash. Uh, and as well for those that need Refuah Shalemah, a complete Refuah Shalemah, B'toch Shach Hodeh Amo Yisrael. Amongst them, uh, Eliyahu Shimon Mazal Fortune and Chana Bat Sima Fega, uh, we should also have Refuah Shalemah. Uh, breakfast in the class also dedicated in loving memory of Binyamin Ar- Erli. Alava Shalom, Lilu Nishmat. Benjamin Meir Ben Tzvi Zev David and Rachel Pesi Alava Shalom. For his neshama to have the highest aliyah for his family to be comforted in the wake of this tragedy. He lost his life at 21. He was supposed to be out of the army this year. Died Al Kiddush Hashem on Shabbat Parashat Toldot. The great grandson of a Holocaust survivor who is fighting to prevent another Holocaust by protecting us all. Now he protects us from Shamaim by Lisa and Yeshaya Averbach. Hashem Yinkom Damam. Uh, the week of, of Kobu was sponsored by David E. Ash in honor of you and your unwavering commitment doing good for the state of Israel and for others around you in these challenging times today and every day. My friends, let us, let us begin. Uh, we also like to wish Mazal Tov and Mabruk uh, to uh, Isaac and Esther Syed on the uh, Brit Milah of their baby boy uh, yesterday. And as well, we'd like to wish uh, Sammy Cross and Esther Shumia Mazal Tov on their uh, wedding, uh, and Jack uh, and Jenna Harosh as well, Mazal Tov, on their wedding this past week. Breakfast in the class is dedicated uh, in honor of Celia Beda, Beda, sponsored by her husband Isaac Beda, and as well dedicated in loving memory of Jack Feldman, Alav Shalom, and Shmat Yaakov Feldman Rose, Alav Shalom, sponsored by Stephen and Gary Feldman. My friends, I want to share with you what I think is a very interesting uh, piece. The Pasuk tells us, Vayishlach Yaakov Malachim Lefanav. Yaakov sent angels from in front of him. He sent angels from in front of him. He sent them to his brother. And he tells him, you know, here I am, I'm coming back. Um, I am uh, your, I am your, it's me, your servant Yaakov, etc., etc. And Rashi says something very, very interesting. He mentions this as well. It's brought down in the Midrash. That's where it's coming from. The Midrash says, Rav Huna Patach, Machzik Be'ozne Kelev, Over Mit'aver Al Riv Lo Lo. You grab the ears of a dog, you're getting involved in a fight that's not your own. What's going to happen if you grab the ears of the dog? It's going to bite you. Shmuel ba Nachman Amar, Shmuel ba Nachman says, Mashal, he gives an example, similar. Le'arkei Listim, a group of robbers. Shaya Yashem be'perashat derachim. They were sleeping at a fork in the road. Avar Echad, one guy passes by, v'tchil la'irotam, starts waking up all the robbers. And what does he tell them? He says, guys, quickly, get up. There's bad people around here. You guys better get up, wake up, and run away. There's robbers, there's thieves, there's bandits. They get up and they attack him. The, the robber says to the man, he says, that bad man that you were warning him about, he actually was sleeping, but you woke him up. You woke up the beast. So too did God say. It was going on his way. Esav was traveling on his, ro- on his own way, doing his own thing. And you send to him. And you say to him, Ko Amar Avdecha Yaakov, so says your servant Yaakov. Now, the Gemara tells us that Yaakov in this moment declared unnecessarily Esav to be his master. These are the words of the Midrash. Why'd you go wake up the sleeping dog? 
Why are you fighting a fight that's not your fight? But the question is, what are we talking about? Is Yaakov waking up here a fight that's not his fight? Who starts this fight? Esav starts the fight. Not the fight with the angel. The beginning of the parasha. Yaakov sends these messengers. Who started that fight? Esav did. Last week's parasha, we know what happened. This is a, a, a long-running uh, animosity that Esav has towards Yaakov. And Yaakov knows that Esav's coming towards him with 400 men. So why in the world are we calling this a fight that Yaakov wakes up? Why is Yaakov compared in the Midrash to the one who grabs the ear of the dog, who gets involved in a fight that's, that's not his, who wakes up the bandit? And the answer, the answer I think, is very powerful. What is the message that he sends to Esav? Says Rashi, I sent to you, I want peace with you. We're good. You and I, we're, you know, we've got shalom between us. Come on, let's make a treaty. Ceasefire. Okay. So the Sefer Otsrot Torah points out something unbelievable. He says that the question that our rabbis are levying against Yaakov is, Yaakov, you know the rules of engagement. The rules of engagement were simply stated from the very beginning. And what are they? Esav has power when Yaakov loses his way. Yaakov, if you're studying Torah, if you're doing the mitzvot, if you have peace amongst your people, you have nothing to worry about from Esav. It's only when you let down your guard when you stop being Yaakov, then Esav now has a way of attacking, a way of ascending, a way of arising. Let's just re remember, ya Yaakov gets the Berachah. What's the Berachah? The Berachah is hidden, it's coded in that which precedes the Berachah. Hakol kol Yaakov, hayadayim ide Esav. When the voice is the voice of Jacob, that comes first, before the hands of Esav. But if we comma, if we move on from that, then the hands of Esav, of our enemies, rise. God is saying to, to Yaakov Avinu, Yaakov, you are studying Torah. You are doing mitzvot. You've maintained your integrity even under the wily trickery of Lavan. Why are you poking the bear? Why are you trying to make peace with him? Why are you telling him he's your master and you're his Eved? Why are you doing that? That is Riv Lo Lo. That is a fight. That's not your fight. I, I want to I share with you because I think that there's tremendous wisdom here. And this wisdom can be found on two levels. Let me explain. There was a, a, a time in uh, Russia, in communist Russia, where studying the Torah was a criminal offense. And at the time, there was a big yeshiva in Novartok, in the yeshiva. And they went to the elders of Novartok and they said, we've had terrible news. The Communist Party is arranging a massive event directly opposite the yeshiva. We only found out about it just now. It's going to happen today. And we're worried, should we be studying Torah in the, in the Beit Midrash, directly opposite the street, across the street from where they're having this convention. They could come in, they could shoot us all, bloodbath. Or rather, should we go and hide in the dormitories and pretend like this is some sort of college and not do anything? The rabbi said, if this is where they are, you need to be studying, you need to be learning. Even if it's across the street, this is what we need to do, this is who we are. And you know, and that, and that will be our salvation. The boys listen wholeheartedly to the to the the altar from Navardak. They go into the Bet Midrash and they're studying. There was two boys that didn't listen. Two boys that thought, you know what? I'd rather hide. They went and they hid in a closet in the dormitory of the yeshiva. Anyway, the uh, they get there. The 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 certain the advanced party arrives. Uh, at, the, uh, at the event to secure the location. 
and they hear noises coming out of this building across the street from the convention. So of course they go to check it out. They walk inside and they see that there's Jewish boys with kippahs and they have books and they're studying and they take out their guns ready to mow them down in the Bet Midrash. Anyway, all of a sudden one soldier looks at the other. He says, doesn't something seem wrong to you here? He says, what? He says, look at these guys. If this is them studying Torah, they should all be sitting down, reading quietly from the books. They're screaming. They're yelling. They're doing this and like that with their hands. And, you know, they're swaying back and forth. This is not a yeshiva. This is an insane asylum. <laughs> Don't you know it's against the Geneva Convention? We can't, uh, obviously not, right? It's against... The laws of uh, international warfare to murder people that are unwell, that are mentally unwell. We can't, we're not allowed to kill these people. The guy says, okay, you're right. Puts his gun back in the holster, the boys keep learning. On the way out, my friends, they see a hallway with rooms and they say to themselves, you know, maybe in the hallways, in the dormitory, there's some boys that are not, or students that are not insane, and maybe those we can kill. They walk down the hallway and they discover two boys that didn't go. They pull out their pistols and on the spot, they take their lives. The rabbis tell us, Torah magina umatzla. Torah protects. Torah saves. And the question we need to ask all the time is, is this a line? Is this something we say? Or is it something we believe? Do prayers help? Or is it the opioid of the masses? What do you believe? And if you can work out when you are not, you know, under the gun, quite literally, when there's not something against your neck, sword is against your neck, what you feel in times of peace, should not stop being true in times of war or in times of challenge. Now my friends, the reason why I'm saying this, and the reason why I'm mentioning this is twofold. First of all, we're trying to understand why is Yaakov being told by Hashem, what are you doing? You started this fight, you didn't need this fight. You know what the answer is? The answer is Yaakov didn't have a fight. In his lane, he didn't need to worry. What did he do though? In his worry, he left his lane. And that itself created the fight. It created the problem. My friends, I think to myself all the time, you know, you have a person who's giving tzedakah, and then time comes and things get a little bit tighter, and you know what? He still has enough money to give tzedakah. He still even has enough money to do to buy the luxurious things that his life affords him. But what does he tell himself? I have a little bit less, so I'm going to give a little bit less. But he didn't come back, cut back in anything else. And what happens? And then the next time, the next year, he gets a little bit less. And then what does he do? He cuts back a little bit more in his tzedakah. But the tzedakah was the thing that was keeping you there in the first place. The Torah, the tefillah was the thing that was keeping you there in the purpose. Who knows? If leaving the synagogue early to be able to go prepare and get there on time early for the meeting is not what winds up costing you that meeting. But when a person doesn't look at it that way, how do they adjust when the meeting doesn't go well? They say, I shouldn't have gone to shul at all today. Meanwhile, what's actually taking place is that the person got rid of the magina o matzla, the thing that protects share with you another example of this. And then I want to take this lesson to another stage, to another level. The second example I want to bring with you is the example of the Hafez Chaim. They were building a hospital in Radin. And they got a big gathering of people together to be able to raise the awareness and the funds to build this hospital. And they were selling beds in the hospital. Every person who could would donate money to be able to buy or to pay for, or to donate a certain number of beds in the hospital. This guy gave 10 beds, fortune. This guy gave five beds, very nice. This guy gave 15 beds, unbelievable, wow. Very wealthy man. 
So as everyone is coming to this event, the Chafetz Chaim is giving a tremendous kavod to every one of the wealthy people that gave all the beds. Thank you so much for coming. We appreciate your contribution so much. What is so special you're here with us? He's giving them time. He's giving them attention. Anyway, as he's sitting there with these wealthy men and he's giving them all the gratitude and the hakarat for all they've done, a group of yeshiva boys came from the local part of Radin and they were there and they also wanted to be there to show support to this monumental and important project. The Chafetz Chaim says, excuse me, welcome, thank you so much for coming, we're so happy to have you here, da, 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 da. He's giving these yeshiva boys and these, and these rabbis and the kolel members a beautiful kavod and honoring them and thanking them for coming. And then one of the wealthy men came up, upset. You know, you honored us because we gave you the beds. So he walks up and he says in front of all these rabbis and the yeshiva boys, he says to the chafetz chaim, he says, oh yeah, rabbi, I see you're giving them a lot of kavod. How many beds did they give? Knowing they don't have a dime. Seeing their ripped clothing. Seeing their beards, their, that they're learned men. How many beards did they give? You're giving them kavod. Besides for us also. The rabbi says, these, this guy, every one of these guys gave 50 beds to the hospital. The guy's mouth drops open. He says, 50 beds? He says, I'm a wealthy man. He says, and I gave 15. You're telling me this, this guy gave 50? And the Chafetz Chaim says, yes, you donated 15 beds. But when I see someone who learns Torah day and night, I know that there are 50 hospital beds in this hospital that are not full because of the words of Torah that come out of his mouth every single day. So he donated 50 beds in the hospital, but they're not located here. They're people who don't even have to get here. The beds that you've donated are for people that we didn't manage to save. The ones that we didn't manage to protect with our Torah and mitzvot, and they're the ones that are here. A lot of times a person doesn't think about this. We notice the things that went wrong in our life and we want to know why. I did all these acts of kindness, Hashem. I prayed, I studied Torah, kept kosher, I did this, I did that, Hashem. How come you made this happen? God says to us, and again, but we don't often hear Him. Do you know how many things didn't happen to you because of those things? Do you know how many problems you avoided? Do you know how many beds are not in the hospital because of all of those things? Yeah, there might be something. And we'll get through that Bezat Hashem too. But you know how much you were protected from? Yaakov Avinu, he sees that Esav is somewhere. And he's thinking to himself, what's going to protect me from Esav? And God is saying, I already had you. You were good. You didn't need to poke the bear. You didn't need to come to Esav and make treaties. You didn't need to come to him and call him your master. You could have stayed in the call, call Yaakov. Everything would have been fine. My friends, I want to share the last element that I believe is important to learn from this, from this saga. I asked you the question. The question was, did, did Yaakov start this fight? Or did the fight start with Esav? And I want to say this loud and clear to every person that is going through any sort of family issue for not a week or two, but for months or years. Fights are not give or take zero-sum games. The fact that a person is in a, uh, in a disagreement for a very long time, you're not either in a fight or not in a fight. There are times when something went wrong. Okay, you're not you're upset at one another. I got it. But then what happened? You figured out a way to coexist. You figured out a way to make this work. Sometimes a person, in not recognizing that this is working in its way, what will we do? We'll go with the stick and poke the dog. You'll go and say to the person, you know, look, we've been fighting for such a long time. Da -da 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 -da. It was working. It was not perfect. But you were building something. You had something. And now what'd you do by bringing out that machloket again? By mentioning it by name. By bringing it to the surface. What did you do? You awoke old hurt. You brought back old problems. 
Sometimes, my friend, my friends, there's a way to get to a better peace, a higher peace. And no doubt it is our obligation to try and escalate peace. You understand those words? Escalating peace. We were in a place where we could barely tolerate each other, but we're not fighting like cats and dogs. Okay, that's something. Now we could go to a better place. And from there, hopefully, to a better place. But my friends, understand when you're waking a sleeping dog. The thing you're waking is still a dog. It's still an Adam Ra. It's still a person that doesn't want things to get better. In such a scenario, who is the Baal Machloket? Even if they started round one, did you start round two? When it was not necessary? When you could have made it better without instigating, without approaching it and declaring those lines again of master and slave, of right and wrong, of who did and who didn't do? You know, I, I find this all the time. People tell me, Rabbi, I want peace. Could you arrange your meeting? You arrange this meeting, they come together, and the person says, listen, we both know that what you did was wrong. <laughs> but I'm willing to, the other guy's already out the door. If you wanted more peace, did you, then did you have to start with war? That, my friends, is a question. Yeah, Esav hates Yaakov because Yaakov has the blessings. So now, what are you going to do to solve that problem? You start sending gifts to Esav? You know what that's like? I want to imagine a guy, a man, and a woman get divorced. And now they're financially cut off from one another. Anyway, the woman still has the husband's credit card. She's buying whatever she wants. Right? Guy gets upset. He says, listen, we're divorced. It's time. You got to cut, cut up the credit card. So what does the girl do? What does this woman do? She buys him a very lavish gift on his credit card. And says, look, I don't want you to be upset. I know I feel bad. I messed up. But yeah, I bought you something very nice. The guy sees it on his bill, on his own credit. Yaakov, you're sending Esav a lavish gift. Where would you buy that from? In Esav's perspective of events, that that beracha should be his. Where, where are you sending this from? And that's what the Midrash is saying to us. There's a sleeping dog. Esav was on his way. He was doing his thing. You were doing your thing. Did you need to poke the bear that way? You didn't need to. My friends, I'm asking, and I think there's a, a powerful line. You remember there's a, a name of a book. It used to be called The Separate Piece. A Separate Piece. Messed up book they made us read in, in high school. I don't know why they pick only messed up books to give to high school students. Un, un, unnecessary people to read a book about a guy who may or may not have killed his, uh, his friend. Ridiculous. Either way. This, uh, forget the book. The title, a separate piece. People are sometimes striving for a peace that is so perfect, for a shalom that is so shalem, that they write the possibility of peace off uh, from existence. A half a piece is also peace. A quarter piece is also peace. It's a piece of peace. Understand that sometimes that's all that is here at this moment. And that's okay. And when the time comes, you'll get another piece. But not by starting, by opening things up all over again. If you opened up round two, then who's the Baal Machloket now? You are. So you want to make peace in a fractured situation. Recognize where things are. And then when you come to the person, understand before you walk in that you're going to let go of what was before. Instead of saying, we know it's your fault, start off by saying, we are where we are. Is there a way that we could take it up a notch where we could have a family meal together? It doesn't have to be long. Is there a way where we could take it up a notch? We don't have to be business partners again. It was so ugly before. But is there a way that we could resolve 
some of the business deals that we've had that are waiting in escrow until we could agree. You're, you're losing and I'm losing because neither one of us is willing to sign. Let's do something. Let's, let's work this out. My friends, that I think is what we're talking about over here. It was Esav's fight in the beginning. But maybe by Yaakov coming and saying, I'm, a master, I'm the servant, you're the master, here's a gift. He poked something he didn't need to poke. He had a way, and that way was by remaining who Yaakov was. And that would have been okay. Hashem should bless us always with the wisdom and the courage to do the right thing in every situation. Baruch Hanayi